Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful evening of See and Learn 2019. <laughs> First off, we want to give a sincere and big thank you to each and every one of you guys for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your presence, so thank you for being here with us at Hideaway. Yeah! <laughs> Those of you tuning in on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. We do invite you to comment where you're watching from. And if you have any questions at the end of our show, please let us know and we'll try to get your questions answered for you. With that being said, we want to give a thank you to Carib Trans. Because of them, it is possible for us to share this with people all around the world. So thank you, Carib Trans. A big thank you to the government of SABA and SABA Conservation Foundation for sponsoring our expert tonight. <laughs> A big thank you to Prince Bernhard Culture Funds for their generous donation and kind support. One more big thank you to all of our sponsors. Without them, this wouldn't be possible, so thank you guys. <laughs> And that raffle we got going on, guys. It is your second to last night to purchase those raffles before we draw it on Sunday evening, our closing night. So for $2 per ticket, you guys be, could be winning any of these glorious prizes. So to explain a little bit about what these prizes are, top right corner, we have two round trip tickets on the Dawn 2 Ferry going back and forth from St. Martin to Saba. We have a wine gift basket from Shea Booba for our wine lovers. <laughs> a beautiful handcrafted Triton Forge knife made by John over at Sea Saba. A two night stay for two people at the Travel Inn on St. Martin. <laughs> we have three prizes from Aquamania. The first is a sunset sail for two around St. Martin. The second, two round trip tickets on the Edge Ferry going back and forth from St. Martin to Saba. Third, we have a tango dinner cruise for two going around St. Martin. So some really cool adventures for you guys. We also have a beautiful piece of glass art made by Joe Bean here on Saba. It's going to be a mermaid surrounded by three seahorses and a sea turtle. Quite beautiful, guys. We, for our divers out there, guys, we have a two-for-one certificate for eight days, seven nights aboard the Caribbean Explorer 2. That visits St. Martin, Saba, and St. Kitts. Yep. <laughs> and last but definitely not least, guys, a two-night stay at Queens Gardens Resort and Spa. Yeah. Pretty neat. Pretty neat prizes, guys. So only $2 per ticket. If you guys want to get in this raffle, let us know. We'd be happy to set you in. Just make sure that you leave your name, a number, and or email. So that way we can let you know that you've won one of these glorious prizes and you do not have to be present to win. All right, now for the more fun stuff, guys. We have a Sabin local here tonight as our expert. So I'll give a little intro on Miss Dahlia Hassel before she comes up. Most Saban locals may recognize tonight's expert as she grew up calling the, this island home. Dahlia Hassel has spent numerous hours working at the Saba Conservation Foundation, especially conducting research dives within the Saber Marine Park. She went off of the island to graduate with a Bachelor of Sci Science in Biology in the United States, then completed her ma Master's of Science in Aqua Aquaculture and Marine Resources Management last year in the Netherlands. Currently, Dahlia is residing on the island of Bonaire and works as an environmental consultant while also serving as the program manager of the Coral Restoration Project with Saba Conservation Foundation. Tonight, she will be presenting on coral restoration and our role in helping the reefs. Please give a warm welcome to Dahlia Hassel. Thanks, I need that. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. 
This is a nice crowd. I like it. <laughs> so some of you may know me. I'm Dahlia Hassel. But uh, some of you have already recognized me on the Fort Bay, the girl who runs around maybe with the pliers, with yellow, and we have buoys and rope. And tonight I'm going to explain to you why we have all these materials. But before I do that, I want everyone um, to think about uh, the importance of our coral reefs, but you've been going through all these see and learn activities and presentations, and actually everything is interconnecting. So I'm gonna follow something that a coral expert has done in one of his presentations, and his name is Dr. David Vaughn, and what he says is, I want everyone to please take a breath. Just take a breath in, inhale. Now, take in a deeper breath. That first breath that you took in, you can thank the forest, you can take the trees, you can thank um, everything that's on the land because they produce the oxygen that you just took in. That second breath that you took in was actually a bigger breath and that is because our oceans compromise 70% of our world. They take in um, the phytoplankton, the algae, and they help support our oxygen as well. So we're at this different uh, shift in uh, the ecosystem now where back then, and I'm going to talk about it more in this presentation, we started out with these beautiful, big, awesome reefs. And a lot of divers here from a long time ago can really say, yes, I remember this. I remember when the reefs were huge. And now the reef has changed into something different. So back then we were really working on conservation and now we've moved into a different method, into restoration, which is actually what we're gonna talk about tonight, coral restoration. Um, it's the process of assisting a damaged, um, degraded type of reef. And I wanna really bring that out tonight to you, why it's important. There we go. Um, coral reefs are really important all over the world, especially here in the Caribbean. For example, they only make up 1% of the, this earth, but they actually sustain more than 25% of biodiversity on the earth. Um, they provide a lot of ecosystem services, and the, what I mean by this is actually what lives in a coral reef? Fish, right? Okay, Dahlia, that's great. But this coral reef provides a nursery, habitat, and eventually it takes in and it can hide all these little fish. And they can have more time to grow, more time to reproduce, and eventually we can have more fish. Because I like to eat fish, but I want to eat it sustainably. So if we have coral reefs more and more, then we can still protect our coral reefs and still be able to eat fish. Also, one of the biggest things of coral reefs, what does Seba have that a lot of people are here for now? We have divers, diving, yes. Um, it's really important that uh, divers see a healthy reef. Um, yeah, so this builds me into why uh, corals have such an important role in the ecosystem. You're like, Dahlia, okay, great. But what is a coral? Because does everybody really understand what is a coral? You look at it and you think, oh, this thing doesn't move. Maybe I can just kick it. <laughs> Please don't kick it. <laughs> Corals are actually marine invertebrates. They're animals. Um, they produce this type of skeleton out of calcium carbonate. And then inside, they pro uh, provide like a sy symbiotic relationship with algae. And then some of them are actually reef builders. For instance, we have two different types of corals, hard corals and soft corals. So the hard corals tend to be reef builders, and then the soft corals, if you're ever snorkeling or diving, you can see these bright colors and they look like plants. Actually, they might be corals. And then the most important part that I'm gonna be talking about tonight is their 3D complexity. These coral reefs, especially branching ones and the reef builders, start to build this 3D, um, yeah, complexity in the, in the ocean. And these are the ones that are gonna help us, especially us on these islands. And I'll explain more about that later. This is an example of what it looks like inside a coral. 
Uh, the tentacles release sting cells when something brushes by them. And some of you who have done night dives, you can really see when the polyps come out and you can see when they're eating. Um, they make their own lime stop, uh, limestone cup to hide in during the day. I've mentioned this. And at night, the polyps come out to catch uh, plankton floating by. Zoancetheli. Can anyone tell me here what zoancetheli is? Max. And yell it out. Don't be shy. Right, okay. We're going to need you to come up and say that. <laughs> or somebody pass on what he said. <laughs> okay. Max actually does coral restoration in Bonaire too, so <laughs> that counts. But what are we talking about here and why is it important to Seba? I wanted to really bring in the Seba Marine Park. Um, a lot of you are diving in it and you can see uh, we, we dive mainly on one side of the island, the more protected side of the island. And this is an example. We have different zones on the marine park, uh, like an anchoring zone, a uh, recreational zone. But corals and fish, they don't see zones. They don't see lines. They don't see boundaries. So for us at the marine park, we have to take into consideration, okay, what are our corals doing and where are they? The Seba National Marine Park was established in 1987, and it is there to preserve and manage Seba's marine resources. It goes up to 60 meters uh, for the water depth, and it has a lot of different coral species. Actually, this week we were going through it, working on our coral ID, identifying branching corals. Um, for instance, Parides asteroides is a different type of coral. It looks more like a ball. And what did it look like over the years? Because I can't envision it. I was born in 1992. So this is giving you an example. I see the coral today. But my father, who was a fisherman, tells me about what he used to see long time ago. So I actually went through all these uh, different historical records at the marine park and tried to dig up all these pictures. And uh, these are some of the corals that I found. I don't see this anymore. And I think, but why am I not seeing this anymore in our marine park? Some of the fish are big, I mean, in the pictures. And my father used to describe, he's like, the fish that we used to catch, whoa, so big. And I'm thinking, well, ha what happened? This is another example from uh, uh, 1987. And you can see how big the reef was looking. It's full of um, corals, sponges, uh, huge fish. And what is the one nice thing that we really have in this marine park is that we have moorings already in place. So what is a mooring? The moorings we have in the marine park have um, their huge blocks that are placed down and then they have a line that comes up to them. And this is actually one reason that we can protect, one way we can protect our coral reef. The boat will come up and it doesn't need to take its anchor down to the reef and destroy it. So this was one way that the Marine Park of Seba said, okay, let's protect it this way. But now, what can you see as different? Okay, I see a really big sponge, and then I see maybe two or three corals, and they're quite small. How did that shift? This was from 2010, and I also see a lot of sand. But that's one thing that I want to talk to you about, community composition. And I'm going to give this, you're seeing this bar graph, but I'm going to give you an example. All right, we're in Wenworth side, right? And you go up in the level, and then you have Booby Hill. So we do a comparison. Okay, some houses in the level have a house with a garden. Some houses don't have a garden. Then we look at Booby Hill. Some have a garden, some don't have a garden. Okay, but when we look at the bigger picture and we say, okay, Wenworth side, St. John's, Hell's Gate, and the bottom. What happened? Oh, actually, 75% is mainly with gardens, and the rest don't have gardens. Think about this when you look at a reef. We look at, okay, throughout the years, we do a lot of uh, reef surveys, and we say, okay, the coral uh, coverage is this percentage this year. Then it goes down the next year. 
and we can see that maybe uh, macroalgae, which is the leafy stuff, that's growing. And then we can say, oh, this reef has really changed between 2008 and 2014. And I want to take a note right now, this bar graph is not for Seba. It's from a different island. But how do we measure it? Like I mentioned, we do various coral reef um, surveys here on the island. We tend to do it once a year with students, uh, especially Yella. He helps support with this. Uh, we take these quadrats. <laughs> Some of the divers are laughing because uh, we did it this week. <laughs> We take these lines out into the reef and we're taking pictures, we're looking at what kind of fish are we seeing, all of this different data we're collecting. So over the years, we can actually say, oh, have we seen a change? No, okay, good. But these, uh, these surveys is what policy advisors, marine park managers, scientists, we all take this in consideration so we can say, okay, something needs to change or something doesn't need to change. Are coral reefs healthy? They're not healthy. This is an example of a picture from a program that we use to analyze the reef. So you see the reef and it puts out all these random points on the picture. So for example, a lot of the points are pointing to the barrel sponge and then once I'm done analyzing this picture, I have to do so many other pictures. It'll give me all of the points and tell me, okay, your reef coverage is this percentage. You have this much of sponges, this much of uh, algae, this much of this and this much of that. And you're thinking, well, I mean, okay, great, but how do I really see this on Seba? I drew this picture, be patient with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to compare to Zeba. And I tried to do it, um, you know, behind the airport because that was really nice and easy. Uh, the black lines are kind of representing the different depths. So the first, uh, the shallower depths, maybe we'll have different types of algae and coral, maybe more brain corals. And then uh, the middle depth, it goes a little bit deeper. We start to have... Uh, branching corals, and in this case that does happen on Seba because our branching corals actually grow deeper. And then as we go even more deeper, maybe we won't see much of corals at all and we'll see sponges and more algae. That's the way you can look at it. If you look at it from here and you say, okay, there's Seba, and as we go down, it's ever changing. Think about it also on the island itself. We start with a cloud rainforest on top, and we go all the way down to Hell's Gate, and the vegetation has completely changed. Apply it the same way underwater. But Dahlia, what happened? You haven't told me what happened yet. <laughs> uh, well, unfortunately, a lot of stuff happened. And this is not just Seba's Reef. Um, this is all over. We've had overfishing. And thankfully, here on Seba Marine Park, we don't have that much fishing. Um, sewage and fertilizer, coastal construction, oils, toxin diseases. I mean, I can go on and on about what's happened and has destroyed reefs in the past and now. Oops, sorry. Um, one indicator that we see, especially when we're looking at it, like what is the cause of the damaged reef is fish diversity. And you're thinking, really? Fish can tell me how the coral's doing? Yes, actually. We have fish that have different functions. For example, a parrotfish. What, is a light, what does a parrotfish do? Well, it's a grazer, and it consumes a lot of the algae. And if this algae starts competing with the coral, does the coral actually stand a chance? So if you're seeing more algae, and less coral, mm, and less fish, okay, maybe there's a link here somewhere. And these are the things you can take into consideration when you're starting your management of your marine park. So I put in this, really, fisheries are typically managed at the level of country or region, not the reef. And it's one thing that we need to consider more often is how is the reef actually looking? I actually wanted to include this, rising sea temperatures. It's a big effect, and it's something we cannot ignore. 
This is a uh, recent, actually. You can see the date above on the right-hand corner, up to 14th of October 2019. Uh, it's pretty warm. This is uh, having a big effect on our corals as well. Maybe some of you may recognize these pictures. This was from Hurricane Hugo. Um, this is on the land. You can see the damages from a hurricane. And on the land, yes, it's, it hurts. I mean, you're seeing uh, trees being destroyed. You see homes being destroyed, uh, properties everywhere, um, debris. But a lot of times, people don't see what happened under the reef, under the water and corals become really damaged during hurricanes. There's huge waves, surges, and a lot of times it just takes them out. And this is what I meant about the shift of the reefs. So how did we go from reef builders to fleshy algae? <laughs> and how do we turn this around? This is a great example from uh, a scientist called Jeremy Jackson. He wrote this um, huge paper back then, and I wanted to show it as a comparison. Here is 1975 in the same reef of Jamaica. You have the branching corals. They have this huge 3D complexity. Okay, and then you have next to it this, um, oh no, that's not the same reef, sorry. This way. <laughs> then you have the Acropora palmata, then we go down to 2013. Okay, I'm seeing still algae, even more algae. What happened to the coral? Well, in the 1980s, we had a huge die-off of the sea urchins. And I know, I know, as a child, I didn't like sea urchins because I wanted to swim, and they would get in my foot, and that was not a pleasant feeling. But uh, the, the we actually call them diadema, and they have a very important function on the reef because they are the consumers of the algae. So we had a big impact when there was a mass die-off in the 1980s. And then on top of that, we had a white plague disease. And it's like, my goodness, what are you going to do? <laughs> and so our coral reefs took a really big hit. And we saw this shift. We saw a macroalgae increase and a coral decline. And basically, our reef ecosystem took a whole different side. And now we're still seeing a continuation of these patterns. This is actually the sea urchin that I was talking about. And what are the scientists saying? They say, OK, you have to be stronger. You have to be radical with your conservation. You need to look at your fisheries management strategies. Simplify the monitoring systems. Include those volunteer divers. Get it done. Foster communication and exchange information. Let's not just keep this information on Seba. We need to contact Borneo. We need to go further. We need to go to Mexico. Talk, talk, talk. Collaborate and develop and implement adaptive legislation. Like I said, not just looking regionally and locally, but also, what is our reef doing? Can we adapt to it? And today, I want to focus specifically on the first one, robust conservation. Yes, yeah, so I don't want to be Dahlia doom and gloom, OK? I'm a happy person. <laughs> but coral restoration takes a lot of work, and we struggle. Funding, um, lack of staff, lack of this, lack of that. Uh, but you know what? Support is crucial, and we need to keep our eyes on the prize. So that's why I'm really glad that all of you came out, because maybe you're not a diver, but maybe you can help in some way or the other, passing on the message, finding somebody who can come to Seba and help us out. Talk, 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 talk. Do not lose hope. Um... How do I press it? OK. This is a success story um, from a very uh, nice friend in Belize. She and a group of people started Fragments of Hope. And this is the reef, 2.5 years on the reef where they outplanted corals. OK? You can still see it's really nice. You have a lot of fish, a lot of different types of coral. They're growing quite well. I'm sorry, the video is sticking. Please bear with me. And also, the people were shaking a lot during the diving. I'll talk to them about it. This is 8.5 years on the reef. Look how large it's gotten. 
This is choral restoration. And this is what happens when you take time, dedication, and you're radical about it. You really push for it and you do it right. So are we doing on Seba? Yes, we are. But it's still very small and I'm okay with that. <laughs> when the Coral Restoration um, program started on Seba, it was a few folks but had a lot of heart. We had the dive shops involved, we have, and most of you know her, Dr. Jennifer Ran. She came with students. The Marine Park put their heart and soul into it. And like I said, very small, but you know what? They're still working at it. Uh, we have 14 trees and ladders, and I'll explain to you what trees and ladders mean. And it's located uh, near a yacht mooring. But this is kind of, if you can see it, right here. That's the Seba Nursery. Um, there's specific restoration techniques that we can use. Coral gardening, which is what we do in Seba. Uh, there's also larval pr propagation of coral colonies and direct transplantation. And that's what the one we're working on right now. So what is coral gardening? Basically, it's a series of methods used to generate new colonies and add them to natural reefs. These are a few uh, pictures of fixed structures that you'll see on reefs, and what happens is they'll attach the coral to it and eventually just let them go, and they'll start growing and growing, and this is what you saw in the video before. They just start overtaking it. But how do they do that? So this way, especially with this species that you see, it's the same species that we work with in Seba. It looks like deer antlers, no? We call it staghorn coral. They can do budding or fragmentation, and budding is actually when it splits into two colonies. Fragmentation is when it completely breaks off and then it can move into crevices and does attachment to the reef. And this happens a lot during hurricanes. Okay. But, okay, I'm gonna take you through Coral Restoration 101 tonight. So first we gotta choose a, a site. And I'll say about, let me tell you, it ain't easy. We don't have shore dives. We got to do everything on a boat. Let me tell you, it is work. But thankfully, we have a really good team at the Marine Park willing to do it. Uh, we have to identify a suitable site. So first, we had to choose, oh, my goodness, where are we going to put a nursery? We need to find sand, uh, space enough. It got to be close to a reef. It has to be clear from disease and have the right conditions. Um, also suitable for the choice of coral that we wanted to work with, the staghorn, and that takes time and effort. But one of the most important things um, that I really want to stress on is genetic diversity. And I won't go into hardcore genetics tonight, trust me. But I do want to mention that when we're considering our corals, we have to fragment them, and then we'll have different genotypes, so think about uh, different DNA strains. And then do we want to mix them? Do we not want to mix them? Do we want to make them stronger? Yes. Do we want to make sure they're going to survive on the reef? Because you're saying, but Dahlia, you just told me that this reef is dying. Why are you going to keep putting the corals out there if they're just going to die? Well, these corals came from now, and they survived the past 30 years. Oh, OK. So collecting corals from physically separated reefs is actually what we do on Seba. Uh, so we have some from Torrens Point now, we have some from Green Island, and this is an indicator that we use, okay, they're genetically different. Great, that can help. And why it's important, if you start cloning the same kind, it may actually harm us than do good. It can lead to a population decline because what happens is when the corals start spawning, if they're the same kind, they don't want to spawn together. They want to go find somebody else. This is an example of a land-based nursery. Uh, we don't have this one on Seba, but we do have this one, the field base, and that's actually one, uh, one tree in our coral nursery on Seba. And you can see how large the coral fragments are growing. We actually use one, this one, this main one, to break it off and feed the other trees. So we can continue propagating as many fragments as possible. 
So these are the structures that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, when we're looking at different structures on SEBO, we have to choose the right one necessarily. We can't put one on the ground because the sand moves too much. So with the trees, they're hanging, they have a buoy, they have an anchor, they have the PVC pipe, and we choose it based on the bottom type. So is it sandy, the environmental conditions, how's the water quality? And then how do we collect this coral? <laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> We actually go out looking for these wild colonies and then we take pieces from the wild colonies. We have to record everything to make sure we know where we're taking it from. And then we start attaching it. And then we see, oh, it's starting to grow. Now we have two pieces on one coral. Great, can we use that? Well, sure. Now we have another piece. And then you kind of have all these little other corals. And we use technical, I mean, it's very easy to cut them. We just use pliers, and that's what I meant. I'm usually running around with pliers, a buoy, a rope, or something. You can see yellow with it, too. And then we do outplanting. So what I mean by this is we take those coral fragments, and then we put them back on the reef. Uh, this is a really good example. We use kind of a marine epoxy. We'll clean the area really well, clean the area of algae and then have a hole, pound the hole, stick a nail into it, stick some epoxy in with it, and then attach the coral fragment to it. And then we have to consider how spaced out are the coral fragments, where we put it on the site. Is it gonna work out? Different attachment methods. Maybe this method won't work. Maybe we have to do it differently. How many coral fragments do we want to outplant? But one of my favorite things to talk about is the reproduction of corals. So the species that we've been uh, seeing over and over is the staghorn coral, the deer antlers. They have very specific times of the, years of the year where they'll come out and it's specifically August, specifically uh, two or three days after the full moon, specifically uh, maybe two hours after the uh, sunset, I mean, it is timed. And then they'll have this huge mass spawning event. And then you see all these little bundles coming out everywhere. And there's a fish frenzy. You just, fish, you just see fish going crazy, eating it. But they have this one mass spawning event to ensure their survival of their offspring. And it's all dependent on lunar cycle, tidal cycle, and everything else. This is an example of actually uh, one that I just witnessed in Bonaire. It's a very short video, but these white balls that you see are the gametes. So we have different types of reproduction, and I'm, don't worry if you don't want to read this. But we have two types, broadcast spawners, which is the one that I just spoke about, the annual mass spawning events. Um, they, they have both female and male. And then we have a brooder spawner. And that's actually, um, there we go. This is a great example. We have one that uh, produces the sperm, and then it goes out, and it does uh, fertilization with a female uh, coral. And then you have fertilization. And uh, this is quite special to see. Actually, recently, I just witnessed a rare sighting of a flower coral producing sperm, and I didn't even know it. I was looking at a whole different coral. <laughs> and then I found out that the reproduction was not meant, to do, not meant to be this way for this type of coral. So to this day, we are still learning about the reproduction cycles of all these species. And this is a good picture of showing you can see uh, first the, the, uh, the colony grows, and then it produces these gametes, and then it has a spawning, external fertilization, and then that's the broadcast spawner. Then we go into the planula, and it has to find a way to go and actually settle on a nice piece of reef, and I have a very nice video coming up with that. And then it goes into a juvenile coral. Then we have the process with the brooder, and then you have the colony growth, and 
again, sperm release, internal fertilization, and then the planula releases and tries to find a place to settle on the reef again. And it's all dependent on coral species. <laughs> Enjoy the video. So this is Cora. <laughs> and this is her home. <laughs> And this is exactly what I was talking about. It is a very special event if you see these mass spawning times. We're, gonna ta we're talking about the birds and the bees of corals, guys, you know? I have some kids here, so I'll keep it uh, <laughs> general, BG. <laughs> and during these mass spawning times, We'll have divers going out. We don't do this technique on Seba, but they've started doing it in other places in the Caribbean that, as you can see, they go with nets and they start collecting it. So the diver collects the coral eggs and the sperm. And then they bring it back. And then we have to work very carefully with this coral egg and sperm. So we have Cora, and then we have Al. And you know, they gotta have some time to get together, get to know one another, maybe go on a couple of dates. And, and then the coral larvae actually develops. And then in the area where we're working with the coral, we have to provide the settlement for them. So it finds a way to settle, and you wait until it grows and grows and grows. And then eventually it's going to be ready to go back onto the reef. And you can do this with multiple of them. And then we as divers like to have fun, and we go back onto the reef and put the corals back out. Then boom, it happens this quickly. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but then we start growing these corals. And then after a while, they do the same process. And then what happens after that? Cora and Al meet again. <laughs> and they settle onto the reef. And then eventually, look at that. We have a new coral reef. <laughs> so I figured this would be a nice video to really wrap it up and actually explain what it is. So that was actually larval propagation, which is the second technique. And though it sounds wonderful and nice and, oh, yeah, you can ensure successful reproduction and recruitment of new corals, but there's benefits and there's challenges to everything, right? So we can uh, really scale up restoration efforts. I mean, like I said, here on Seba, we have it very small. But with this, okay, we can bump it up really, uh, you know, big. Let's, let's just keep putting corals out there. Let's go nuts with it. Work with a lot of different types of corals and then increase that genetic diversity. But then, okay, to do the work, it's a bit difficult. You have to do night diving. Night diving on Seba. It's fun, it's great, you can do it, but you need a boat. <laughs> and you need to make sure, okay, where are these corals? Where are they spawning? Predict the time. It's a long process. Then you have to rear the larvae, and that takes time as well. And you need the proper settings, the right environmental conditions, in the, uh, maybe a wet lab. And you're working microscopically with small corals. And this is an example of what it looks like underwater. They take these huge nets and then they put it over a coral. And at the top of it, they'll have a, a little tube and then they collect everything and run really fast to the lab. <laughs> so they're mixing the colonies when they come up. 
Um, and they're, like I said, they're actually trying to work as fast as possible. A lot of these people are working through the night to ensure that there is fertilization between the sperm and the um, egg. And then um, they even have a way to determine, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there needs to be enough of sperm to ensure that there's sexy time with the eggs. <laughs> So, as you can see, you've already got three or four people in that picture, a whole setup. It takes teamwork to actually make this work. And this is what they look like microscopically. And this is one of my favorite videos. I hope you enjoy it. It's a baby coral searching for a home. <laughs> what happens it takes a while actually for all of these um, larvae to take time to settle because they have to find the right reef too and I, I don't know if this is true but apparently one in a million during those mass spawning events might survive so that's why we actually have so many gametes they're facing uh, predators uh, yeah they can't settle either so we're, uh, you can understand a little bit more why these corals need a little bit of help. After the outplanting and the transplantation and everything, we have to look at how they're doing. So we go and do monitoring. Uh, one of the things that we consider is their mortality. Is it low, partial, high? Have they died completely? Are they still alive? Um, we take other things into consideration, but this is one of the biggest parts. If they have died completely, we need to look for the cause. Why is this uh, site not working out for us? But, yeah, there's a lot of damage to reefs. And now we need to bring that coral restoration in for coastal resilience. We're having more hurricanes, stronger hurricanes, um, replacing those damaged or loss of reef structure, stabilizing the damaged reef structure, enhancing coastal protection, and what I mean by that is, sometimes it's not just working with corals. There's another project going on at a Seba Marine Park. Um, they're working with these type of structures. They're uh, called like with cake layers, reef balls. Actually, we have some students in the back there if you ever want to go and talk to them about it. And they're meant to provide a habitat area for fish, but you can also stick corals to them. And on the right-hand side, you'll see, oh, what is he doing? It's a 3D uh, model that um, was, what is it, 3D printing model that they have used to put underwater to stick the corals onto. And they've built it so it can be more of a suitable condition for those corals. This is an example of actually what happens on your beach when you don't have a higher coral. And that's when I was going back into the 3D complexity. So if you have the branching corals, they actually take in a lot of wave energy. So if you don't have it, you have uh, more waves going onto the, re onto the beaches and causing more erosion. And yeah, we don't have sandy areas here on Seba, sometimes on Wells Bay, sometimes in other parts. But if we did have that coral reef complexity and it was built up more, when we do have the hurricanes, we can have more protection and lower that wave energy when it comes to the shoreline. And this is an example. So as you can see here, the blue is pointing to the actual reefs that are out there. So then the waves just come to this way and then they're becoming, the wave energy is getting higher when it's coming to the beach. So the, wa the reefs are actually protecting it. And this is what I want to go again, and uh, sometimes you can't do it with all just coral reefs, and we need those physical structures like the Arosa is working on. Those reef builders, they can act like wave breakers al almost. And when they're building these things, they actually look at the reefs and say, oh, 
Can we resemble this somehow so that we're not changing it too much? But, okay, that's great and all, but collaboration is key. And that's why, you know, I want to stop for a minute, and I want everyone to take a deep breath again. Yeah, that feels like hope. I know a lot of times we've gone through these uh, presentations and we say, oh, this is not working, that's not working. But you have people who are still hopeful and they want to work on the reef and they want to do good on the reef. So all of you who are here tonight, do not lose hope. There's, we can still do something about it. And like I said, yeah, you may not be a diver, you may not be a snorkeler, but in one way or the other, you can help the environment. You can change the way you think about things, you can change your usage, you can change your consumption, and actually help the corals, and essentially help Seba. Uh, these are the collaborators. Definitely Rescue, Wageningen, DCNA, WWF, See and Learn. Uh, Sanford is Dr. Jennifer Rahn, who's played an important role in the coral restoration, Sea Seba, and Seba Divers. Thank you so much to these people who help us. <laughs> and before I move on, there's one person here that I really have to thank. Um, he's in the back somewhere. Yala, can you stand up? <laughs> All right, everybody, please clap for Yala. <laughs> he's our Marine Park Ranger. And he does it all. He puts in all his effort for it, and we're very proud of him. You too can become a friend of the Seba Marine Park. <laughs> and thank you. So do you have any questions? No? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> yes, Jobin. Um, thank you, you're amazing. Oh, thanks. So the question is, have they already started transplanting corals on Seba? Yes, we have started. Uh, we've started very small. And the goals for the upcoming years is to start out planting 1,000, 5,000, and really going higher with those fragments so we can actually make a difference with the restoration. Part B of that question. Part B, okay. What's been the success? Sorry? What's been the mortality or the viability? Well, here... It's also, we were trialing, oh, sorry. She's asked what is the success rate of the outplantation uh, session here on Seba. Uh, in some places, it's been re doing really well. We've only had like two or three out of, uh, I think, 30 die. And then we had the total opposite end of the spectrum where almost all of them died. I think uh, that's where I was talking about that we have to take into consideration the time of the year when we're out planting, so not too hot. Like I showed you in the earlier uh, little video, a lot of uh, hot sea temperatures, and it doesn't help the corals. It needs to be cooler. Uh, also, the way we transplant, um, how you handle the corals. But we're working on to get that um, numbers up better. Yes? Can you give some sort of context to how much of the reef has disappeared and then maybe how many years you anticipate before it can get back to its prime state? Okay, so the question is, um, what, uh, how am I going to word this question? <laughs> um, how can the, what is, like how long is it going to take the reef to get back to what it was before, correct? Like what percentage is there now versus say what it was when your dad was fishing on the reef? Oh, um, <laughs> what the percentage of what the reef was looking like back then to what it, needs, uh, to what it is now and how can we get back to that? That's a very good question. Um, it's something that we're working on right now because we're, what happened along during that time is we did not have reef surveys. So we don't have those comparisons. Um, and this is kind of the annoying part, but we need to do the science continuously to actually say, oh, okay, we need to do this to get it up to this level. Um, and back then, we only had reef surveys in a couple of areas. So I'm basing a lot off local knowledge and not off numbers. <laughs> and that sometimes doesn't help. So to be honest, I don't have an exact number for you right now. But um, yeah, well, actually, in the most of the Caribbean, it's way below 30% right now of the coral coverage percentage. Uh, so we, 
uh, actually in the plans that we have, everyone's working towards back to that 30% overall in the Caribbean. Anybody else? Does that answer your question, first of all? Yeah, kind of. Kind of, yeah. but we can talk later. Yeah, I'll talk. <laughs> Tom. Uh, yeah, um, I've, I've always felt that on Seba, the, uh, the distribution of our branch corals, like the uh, elk horn and the stack horn coral, was um, limited by the natural phenomena, such as you know our winter swells and hurricanes. So, in in your coral restoration program, how you how do you address these limitations? What what do you do to overcome these problems? So Tom asked a really good question. Um, Tom has a lot of experience in the marine park. <laughs> and he's saying that we, uh, he knows that throughout the years, the elk corn and the staghorn coral have to face a lot of natural phenomena. How do we um, deal with this in our coral restoration program? Uh, one of the ways that we deal with this is choosing our restoration sites, first of all. Where are we going to restore first? and how does that actually, how is that site being affected by wave energy? So that's one way. Next uh, thing that we're looking at is also, you know, uh, staghorn grows here at 22 to 26 meters. So that's another thing that we have to consider. Can we uh, work at restoring those corals at that depth? Elkhorn coral, on the other hand, is growing quite shallow. Um, and to be very honest, it's very hard to work against hurricanes. But we need to work fast. And luckily, with branching corals, you know, they do grow fast in their coral restoration. But actually, one of the biggest things I want to target now is working outside and working in a wet lab to promote already the fertilization, promote already the growth. So when we're putting them back on the reef, uh, they have a, a higher chance of survival. But to be very honest, it's difficult with hurricanes. You know, it's going to happen. It's uh, something that we just have to face as well. Does that answer your question? OK. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Out in the natural or the oceans, you know, the corals are feeding on their own. <coughs> they're gathering food. What do you feel when you're um, artificially growing up so to Well, they won't actually, s oh, sorry. She's asking um, in the real world, they're feeding, they're doing their own thing. Well, first of all, here on Seba, uh, we only do it out in the ocean. So they're handling themselves anyway. But if you do the larvae propagation, it's not going to be uh, long term. You try to ensure the fertilization and allow the settlement and then put them back onto the reef. It's to work quickly. Also, um, Within the lab, hey, that's a really nice noise, huh? <laughs> it's like background music. Um, basically, we try to work as fast as possible, but making sure they're actually back onto the reef quickly, too, to ensure they're. Uh, sorry? You know it. Okay. <laughs> Max. So I know in Bonaire and some of the restoration sites. I can't hear you. Could you come a little bit closer or someone pass on the message? Like I said, I've got a DJ in the background, so. <laughs> so in Bonaire and some of the restoration sites were absolutely decimated by fireworks. Oh, yeah. Problems. Do you see that high density fireworks in the Seba restoration sites? Um. His question was that in Bonaire, in his experience with the coral restoration program, he witnessed a lot of fireworms and snails that, you know, cause a lot of issues and eventually diseases and whatnot. Do we see that on Seba too? I've actually not seen that many fireworms, but we do witness them on the nurseries already. And I think the, just like the algae, we just have to be hands-on with it. Luckily, we're not, it's, yeah, it's two sides of the coin. We're not as big as Bonaire. We have a very small nursery site that we're able to control. So we have a, you know, eyes on the prize kind of thing. Whereas maybe in Bonaire, you got how many nursery sites? A lot, a lot yeah. Yeah. Is there anything like 
steroids that can sort of expedite the growth of corals when they're doing them on these land-based things? Have they found anything that speeds up the process? Uh, I'm sure they have, but I don't have experience with, oh, sorry. <laughs> he asked, um, are there any steroids that we can use on the coral so they can we can make it go faster? Um, in my experience, we t I know we tend to stay away from those things, but I wouldn't know for sure, to be very honest with you. I yeah. Are there water conditions that are yeah, and well, that kind of stuff that we don't find in the oceans as often? Yeah, he's asking what also, like, could it help with the type of conditions and everything? And that's definitely it. When you have it in a, for instance, outside in a land base, in a wet lab, you can control it. You really can control the temperature, um, the pH, make sure that they're feeling just right. So, yes, you can. And also choosing resilient coral species. Yes. Can you grow in a lab urchins or import them from different areas? That's a really good question. Um, his question was, can you grow urchins in a lab and then transport them, right? Is that? Well, either, either in a lab, like in an urchin farm, or transport them, say, from Cayman and bring them over. Are they regionally like specific? Well, um, so basically working with the urchins in a lab and then bringing them out into the ocean, or can you bring them from other places to here? Right now, and I think I did mention this, we have a nice project on SEBA. Uh, like I said, talk to the students, they're in the back. Uh, also the head person at the Marine Park, his name is Alvin. They are actually working on specifically restoring the sea urchins. So they'll collect the juveniles in traps, put them in aquarium, let them grow, let them survive, and then place them back out into the reef. So that's one method. Um, Choosing different type of urchins, I'm not sure how that would work because to get from here to Stasia, you got to go through St. Martin. It's a long process. So right now, we're definitely just working with Sabo. Yeah. Um, I'm going to actually stop the questions for now because I have another presentation, so be patient with me. So you may have heard what's been going on. We have a single-use plastic ban on Seba now. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Somebody is being blocked right now in the parking lot. Could they move their car? A32? Anybody? <laughs> Oh, nobody? Okay. Uh, moving on. We have a single-use plastic ban on Seba, and I wanted to give you a little update from the local government of Seba for it. But to give context of that, why are we working on really banning this single-use plastics on Seba? First of all, a plastic bag will last 20 years. A plastic cup will last 450 years. That one time that you use it, Ugh. <laughs> Even um, the things that you see, a plastic water bottle, 450 years. It takes a long time for these uh, things to degrade. And what happens? So why would we use a single-use plastic ban on Sebo? Well, this is just an example of what happens. We have uh, those commonly found plastics. Trust you me, cigarette butts are a big thing on the beaches. Um, They'll go into the ocean, they start off the land, they start with us, then they go off into the, uh, into the ocean through rivers and streams, and maybe we don't have that on Seba, but we do have guts, let me tell you. And then we have marine mammals like whales that are being caught up, entangled, they can't come up, and they basically die. Also, uh, ingestion, I've actually uh, done a dissection on a turtle before, and it died because of the plastics. It could not eat anymore, and it just completely was covered in small plastics. And then we have this vicious cycle that just continues and continues. But you're thinking, okay, but that's, uh, yeah, okay, I understand. I really feel bad for the animals. Well, do you like to eat fish? Yes, I like to eat fish. But what happens to that plastic when it starts to degrade, and you can't see it anymore? and it starts to go in the ocean. Then we have fish eating it, and then we have microplastics. And then all of a sudden, 
Oh, I want to eat a fish. Yeah, guess what? Now you got it too. So think about this when the next time you're using single-use plastics and why we're working so hard with the local government to really ban this. Um, ignore all the writing. I'm going to talk about it. One of the things that they do in the Netherlands is called the Statsiegeld, and it's actually one of the ways that maybe we can uh, reuse the plastics. So you may pop in, this is just an example. You may pop in your bottle and then rec receive some money back for it, and we can just continue this cycle, and then we don't have the plastic bottles in the guts anymore. How nice would that be? Uh, in August 2019, the local government actually performed a questionnaire and it circled around. They received about 200 uh, responses. And around 90% of those responses said, yes, we do see a problem. And this instigated to where the go local government said, okay, it's time to take action with it. And everybody was saying, okay, 80%, let's implement more measures to tackle this pollution on the island. Um, let's have something like Stadsigeld on the island to work with the pollution. And then around 70% were in favor of implementing a fee on disposables. We do have recycling on SEBA. So the whole point of the public entity of SEBA, they want to ensure a healthy uh, living environment, promote sustainability for you and I and the island itself. Because what happens is this environmental pollution affects nature and wildlife and you and I. And we need to do something about it. So the most visible thing that they want to work on right now is the single-use plastics. And first of all, I think uh, they want to use friendly alternatives, which is I'm trying to look for right now. It was right here. Thank you. And See and Learn is so kind enough where they've been providing these friendly alternatives. So instead of you going to the bar and saying, oh, I would like to have a plastic straw. <laughs> well, maybe not have a plastic straw. How about you have, if I can open the bag, that would be great. But you have a metal straw. You can clean it, and then you can take it in your pocket. There's even some that are bendable. And bam, you have your straw for next time as well. They also have uh, different types of cutlery that you can use instead of using the plastic ones. So we're going to have some different alternatives. And one of the things that they wanted me to update you with is short-term and longer-term goals. So short-term, they want to talk to different stakeholders. For example, you're a stakeholder, the public. Um, also, restaurants, medical students, everybody who's a consumer. Um, let's think together. This is not just one person's idea. This is a community idea. If you have a great idea about what to include in this type of ban and what we can do, go and talk to your local government. They're always willing to listen. Uh, education, communication, awareness, um, and eventually we have the longer term where it turns into legislation. And the ban in place, uh, the aim is being the second quarter of 2020. And finally, we're going to monitor it. How does the consumer actually feel about it? But what do you think? If you have questions, uh, feedback, maybe something cool that you saw in a different country that you thought, hmm, maybe this can work on SEBA, uh, you can come and talk to Sarah. Can you please wave your hand? She works with the public entity of SEBA. And please give her fee your feedback and questions. If you can't find Sarah, then you can look me up and I'll pass the message along. But um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. If you have any further questions, just come see me after the presentation. And please, support Hideaway, support um, See and Learn, and you can be a friend of the Seba Marine Park too, so support us too. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot, I have candy for the kids. The adults can have some too, but if you're a child and you would like some candy, I appreciate you coming, so come get some candy. <laughs> All right, thank you, you Dahlia, so much. Another round of applause for Dahlia, please. 
All right, we just have a few more upcoming events for you guys for See and Learn 2019. Tomorrow, we have two field projects. First of all, we have a research, shark research dive with expert Chelsea Black, who is somewhere in the middle here. She's waving her hand, yep. So if you want to go on a dive with Chelsea tomorrow, 1 p.m. at Fort Bay Harbor. Then we have a stargazing tour at 9.30 p.m. with our galaxy expert, Sydney Lauer, who is also right here in the back, yep. <laughs> If you join either of these present, uh, field projects, you can receive one of our packets of sustainable cutlery, as Dahlia just mentioned. And then on Sunday, we have our closing night at Shea Booba, 5.30 p.m. Chelsea will give an excellent presentation on sharks. So be sure to come to that. That is also when we, were, we will be doing our raffle drawing. So plenty to do still. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Thank you, Facebook, for joining in. Thank you, Hideaway, for hosting all of us. Please stay for drinks and dinner. And everyone else, have a wonderful night. Thank you, Carib Trans. <laughs>
that customer dedication has made Caritrans what it is today. Now as part of a larger family with more transportation resources, Caritrans hopes to grow beyond its current market, offering services to additional Latin American ports and eventually Europe and Asia. But even when it becomes a global logistics company, Caritrans wants to stay true to its roots, always providing personalized, reliable customer service and a commitment to the communities it serves.